Hey guys, welcome to Hunker Down with Seth, the special apocalypse edition. Uh, if you are seeing this in the future, you know this is what humanity once looked like, and we are not doing so well right now. I have a special guest, uh, the one, the only my mindful adventure dot com founder, operator, and uh, obliterator, uh, Sarah Scheller. Sarah, there you are. What's going on? Hi, Matt. What an intro. You know, I, it feels like we got double apocalypse going on right now between the smoke and the COVID. Yeah, it, it's it's Blade Runner. I mean, it's sci-fi. We're doing it. Oh, did you see the video um, of San Francisco with, I think it was with the Blade Runner music. Yes. It's just like, oh, so creepy, man. Yeah, it, it's... Like, I looked at the sun immediately before we started, and it was just this little orange ball. And it was terrible, and... And just not... not. It's one of those things, I knew that we were going to kill ourselves, but I was hoping to turn 50. You know, I had a few things on my bucket list I need to knock off still. Would you believe I've never been to Disneyland? Uh, I would, but that's because I don't think I've been to Disneyland either. And you're a traveler? I know, right? Um, well, part of it is I'm not much of a, like, theme parks person as an adult. Uh, I wouldn't really do that a whole lot as a kid. I think we went to Disney World, but I was like, I don't remember it. I just know that people have told me, like, you went here, yeah. and I was like, oh, okay, cool. What did I do? And they're like, you said hi to Mickey. And I'm like, oh, that sounds like me. All right. Yeah, that's that's one notch on the bucket list. And uh, I suppose. And not blaming Sarah for this, but because of the audio, I have to uh, keep my fan <laughs> off. So just to let the people in the future know, I am sweating buckets right now. It is about 413 degrees in Long Beach, California. <sighs> But it's generally 10 to 15 degrees hotter in L.A., so I got that going for me. Um, yeah, and you're in Spokane. Spokane, Spokane. I, it's, I lived in Seattle for over 10 years, never learned how to properly pronounce it. it uh, God, I don't know. I think it's Spokane. But, you know, I've heard some people be like, oh, yeah, Spokane. And I'm like, I, I don't know. So I, but I'm also... Uh, not the greatest at pronunciation. Yeah. It's... Uh, did, we, did we talk about like my cavalry? Cavalry. Cavalry. Uh, I can't. So I'll be playing Risk, and I'm like, my cavalry, and people are like, no, it's it's not. That's that's where Christ died. Um, are you talking about your horse things? Yeah, but you could say Yakusk easily in Risk. <laughs> oh, that's. You know, the trick with risk, you start with Australia and South America, just get your foothold there and go from there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, as long as you've got, because they're nice and isolated, the worst is landing up in Europe when you start. And, Oof. Um, then COVID strikes and you end up on a plane all the way back to the U.S. And, no, I'm kidding. No, that, that was absolutely accurate. Interesting, <laughs> interesting showbiz story that I have for you. Uh, Dana Carvey, star of Wayne's World, who played Garth, I don't know if you're familiar with him, um, he's Saturday Night Live, star of the Dana Car Carvey show, Master of Disguise, why am I even saying this? So Dana Carvey, uh, I uh, had dinner one day, no it was dim sum, with this woman named Joni, who was like a San Francisco comedy legend, da and she grew up knowing Dana. And his family, while playing Risk, they would have different hats for different areas. And if you controlled that area, you would have to put that hat on. So you'd have like a dozen and a half hats on if you're winning. And, it, <laughs> and if the hat falls up, off, you lose that place. So that's a... That is such a fun way to play Risk. Yeah, and only Dana Carvey could bring it up. Uh, it was Side eye um, for moves and things. 
I think I would have preferred it with the hats. I like I like his version. Yeah, I come from a Jim Romy family, so we ten card. We got scoring down. We would literally it. We would have times where uh, I would play my mom in a game, and then I would when I was visiting Wisconsin, then I'd fly back. The, the next time we would visit, um, we would finish that same game, same scores. So. Whoa. Yeah, we're intense. And my baby sister is the best gin rummy player on the planet. She, I don't know what it is. She's like, cause probably cause my grandpa would keep her on her his knee while they were playing, but uh, <laughs> she could wipe the floor with that. She remembers what people threw down. She remembers like little patterns. You know, she would remember what. It's crazy. She's a cosmetologist. She's the smartest woman I've ever met, business sense wise, and. She's just, you know, she's the baby. Dang. Uh, so, but she's got, like, I mean, I feel like with Jen Remy, tracking who's thrown down what, when, is so key to really being able to play against whatever people got in their hand. It's cheating. It's straight up oh. cheating. It's like... Oh, it's necessary. I, I know, but it, it's... It's out there. It, it it's like people who are good at horse racing. It's, no, just put money down on a horse, enjoy the time. <laughs> okay, so you're saying this to someone who's trying to like how to play poker right now. Oh, poker's fun. It's um, yeah. You know the the trick with poker is um, well, there's so many tricks. I I'm actually a very good poker player. I, I I've got a bunch of a. Uh, Okay, um, let's see, good tips. Uh, first of all, you being a previous actress with your experience, never ever, wait, are you doing online or, or face-to-face? Well, um, I mean, I want to be able to learn to be able to do it face-to-face, but right now it's like online where there's like Zoom, so people can see me, but yeah. I mean, it's like, you can see me right now, I'm totally washed out, it's, eh, you only get so much information. Yeah. Well, even if you're doing Zoom poker, I would say silly hat, sunglasses. Like oh. crazy sun, Like really get them out of the element. You make it a fun thing. And uh, always jacks are better. Uh, just be patient. Just let the cards come to you. If you don't think you have a winning hand, don't bet. Fold. You know, I've, so hard. I know, but if you want, are you doing it for fun or money? Well, I'm doing it for fun, but I oh. mean, why not money down the road? If I get good, right? Like, if, if I can learn enough of the, here's what you do. But you're totally right. Jacks are better. Yep. There's, you know, you gotta, and uh, like, I'm learning about position around the table, and I'm learning about bet sizing, and um, yeah, it's, it's just such a fascinating game to me, because it's like, if somebody took chess and they added an element of chance in there. Um, okay. And then they were like, now on top of all of that, you need to, it, it depends on when you're moved, like when yeah. you have the ability to move your queen. I'm like, oh, yeah. man. And always forget what happened before. Every hand is brand new. You, you know, if you've got, a, if you got four cards and needing a, needing a six for a straight, and you got a six like three hands ago, just dealt and then another six two hands ago you know play it smart always you know always have short-term memory and let's see oh i could tell you uh i always play in a casino or in a controlled environment i never do house games and the reason because in college a buddy of mine he had a, a basement game that got pretty popular. It got up to three tables, you know, 30 people. And then one day, uh, about an hour into playing, three guys with shotguns came in and said, give us your money and your uh, wall, you know, give us your wallets, your phone, and everything. So. Were you there? Yeah, of course. So, oh, my God. Yeah, as soon as I, I give him my wallet, I give him my watch, I give him my cell phone, I said, I'm only playing in casinos from now on. Yeah. That's so crazy. Definitely. I mean, dang. Yeah, and not only that, uh, 
now even if I play a house game, I establish rules at the beginning. Because, you know, always have all your chips on the table at all times. You can't have people hiding chips. You can't have people adding chips. you got to have all your chips right in view. Um, personally, I bring this up. Some people do it. Some people don't. But I, I prefer to do it is if someone shows their hand to somebody, they got to show it to everybody. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that makes sense to me, because, like, yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, it's... Just so much information about what the player does. Yeah, and that's yeah. that's during a hand. If, if you know, the hand's over, they fold, they can do whatever to show everybody, but during a hand, they're like, hey, check this out. I always re request that they show everybody for that. And... I'm trying to think... Um, Good poker tips. Um, I would say fold as much as possible. Like, if you're not sure about something, fold. If you don't, if you think somebody has something, fold. Because that way, if you got something and you play, yeah, you know, it's all setting up for the bluff. Is poker? You, because you fold, fold, fold. You get a reputation for folding. Then only having the good hands. Two and a half do hours down the line. You could say, "Oh, I got, you know, three sevens, uh, jack and sp or three seven spade and heart," and be like, "Oh, wow, this is a good hand." Just, yeah. You know, but it, it's one of those things, you know. Make the bluff the rare thing. Don't make the good hand the rare thing. So. That's what I need to get better at, and the folding, and the folding. Yeah. Let's be let's be honest. You yeah. know, and uh, I. I recognized because I've been playing like Zynga poker to like yeah. you know, okay well, let's let's just like get those and I mean it's different in Zynga poker because no one's actually playing for money so they do stupid things yeah and you get to the other end and you're like really you called a half a million dollar bet with a seven and a three like <laughs> what um but but it's interesting to like play in Zynga poker. Um, because I've noticed, like, these habits that I get where I'll be like, okay, this is a good hand. I've got, like, an ace-king, and I'm just going to, like, you know, really, I'm going to bet on this, and then, like, you know, the flop comes down, and the turn comes down, and, like, there's a potential for a full house on the table, right? Yeah. And if anyone bets, I need to be ready to walk away from that, and it's just so hard. Yeah, it's poker. Yeah, the the key stat in my mind that I talk, that I I'm not good with explaining things, and it's terrible that I have a show where I mainly talk, but the key stat I remember in all poker is if there's five people, including myself, at at the table, no matter what's in my hand, the odds of me having the best hand is one in five. So even before the flop, I have a 20% chance. So if I... Now... Now then it comes, you know, who bets on the flop, because never be afraid to just match the blind. But if somebody says, yeah, I'll put $10,000 instead of, you know, $5 blind, it's like, yeah, he must have a pair of eights. But my uh, pair of sixes can't beat it, so. But, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's the other thing that, like, I thought I knew all the poker hands. Oh, when I was, when it, when I was really early on, though. <laughs> Um, I got stuck on this idea that three of a kind beat a straight, and I was like, I've got this. Like, I'm, no. like, so on top of this, and I just kept betting and matching bets. <laughs> no, I got to the end, and I was like, what? Wait, what happened? And I was like, okay, look, you gotta, you, you gotta figure out the hands now. And yeah. you, like, this is basic, you know. Now, what's the best hand you've ever gotten, and where was it?
and like two fours drops. And I was like, kidding me right now? And I just slow played it. Yeah. At my, uh, it was an employee Christmas party at my old company. It had to be 2014 or 15. Uh, I've, I got dealt two aces, and then on the turn, uh, and on the flop was another ace, and on the turn was another ace. And the person I was playing, I knew, like, I was slow playing the whole time, and since this was a company Christmas party, and she was a friend that I was playing, it's one of those things where the chips really don't matter. So I, I knew to make it official, I had to you know, make sure that she doesn't fold so I could actually beat her with a four of a kind. So, literally, I checked all the way to the end and then showed showed her and the dealer. I had her husband come over just to prove, you know, to get another witness that I got four aces. <laughs> so Four aces, man? Yeah, I know. Although oh, I was... I was in a... The casino I used to play at in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, they had a standing order, like, you get a royal flush, no matter what, they give you 50 bucks cash, and I was in the same room of someone who got that. But, same rule, you have to take it to the end, so, that, that was fun. Yeah. Oh, man, I, I mean, I think, like, even if I didn't, even if I didn't take it to the end, I would still show those cards. Oh, yeah. I mean, like, those are just, that's just, like, a little badge of honor there. You know, pocket aces. Yeah, it, it's great. It, it's fun. But the key thing to remember is when you're actually doing it for money, you have to set your limits. Uh, I would say the difference between a tourist and a gambler is a tourist walks into a casino with a $100 expecting to walk out with 1000 while a gambler walks in with a $100 expecting to walk out with 200 So it's one of those things... You set your limit. As soon as you hit that, walk away. So, That's good advice. Yeah, I mean, gambling is all about control. The house is always favored, but poker, you got some control. Yeah, and as long as you stop before, as long as you walk away before they can take their money back. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, you're going to lose money, oh. so. Yeah. I, I want to go to Vegas. That's on my, like, bucket list of, like, now that I'm, like, figuring out poker, I'm like, I, I, I have to at least go to Vegas once. Like, I have to, I have to experience this. Um, yeah, I've been once for five days, and unless you got a bunch of shows planned or, bun like, an itinerary planned, you don't need to go for more than three. You know, because the gambling at where the sheen of gambling wears off really fast. So. I believe it. It's a lot of, uh, my understanding is that it's like a lot of flashing lights and a lot of like. Yep. It's a lot of glitz. You, going. you know, it's, it's one of those things, uh, <clears throat> they pull back the curtain after a while and you see the, the guy operating the pulleys and stuff. It's, it's a money-making venture for them, but you'll eat good and you'll get to see it. It, it is really a spectacle to behold. Plus, I really want to see that water Cirque du Soleil act. Have I you got, heard about this? I've heard about it, but I think Cirque du Soleil went bankrupt because of the pandemic. Sorry to... Yeah. My fault. What? what? Oh my god! No! I love Cirque du Soleil! I know. One the... What the hell, Seth? God! The only Cirque du Soleil I ever saw was um, in Amsterdam, so it was all in Dutch, and of course it's Amsterdam, so I was really, really high, and the guy I was with, um, he was on mushrooms, and... Uh, oh, oh man, Cirque du Soleil on mushrooms, oh it can't be bankrupt. I don't know, I've never done mushrooms, so I wouldn't know what to, what to even picture for that. But, during the intermission, I asked him, how are things going? He said, it was crazy when that guy did a back thri flip through the hole of the big top. And I was like, we need to get you some water. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. I, I mean, I can't even, can't even imagine. It's, wow. Yeah. 
It was uh, oh, think... the show was Dra Lion, D R A L I O N. It was like a dragon lion. I don't know. Oh, cool. Yeah, they had a bunch of people last flipping. One, the last one I saw was um, it was in Issaquah. You know that big top over there. Yeah, of course. Uh, crap, I don't remember the name of it, but um, it was it was really cool. They did. Like, I particularly enjoyed the clowning bit um, and the contortionist that they had. Like, they lifted her up by her hair, basically. Jeez. Um, and she was, like, doing contortion in the air. And I was like, what? This is insane. Yeah, that's why you pay 175 bucks a ticket. True. True. Yeah. They're not doing improv there. They're not asking for a... <laughs> <laughs> you know. Although... I went to the actual Second City Theater, like the big, the original one in Chicago. The main stage act was 80 bucks, but that's because, you know, they're going to say two or three people from the show is probably going to be on Saturday Night Live in a few years. So I just went to a side stage, and I realized if you take away the top improvisers, like the absolute top great ones, all improv is basically the same, you know. The majority of improv <laughs> is the 99% and below, not the top 1%. Oh, man. I, like, part of me is like, I want to fight you on that. And then there's another part of me that's like, think about all the shows I've seen. I feel like I've seen really good nuggets that happen. Um, but they're from the improvisers that are really solid about crafting that story and making the making it matter and like sticking yeah. with whatever the first thing is that happens yeah, yeah. And, and in improv's defense i will say bad improv is way better than bad stand-up <laughs> i guarantee I mean, it's, <laughs> yeah yeah i have yeah i mean there's something about watching three people stare at each other on stage like are you going to get me out of this because I don't know what to do right now? That's that's just funny in a painful way. What's even more painful than that is being one of those three people. <laughs> I've definitely been one of those three people. Where I was just like newbie. Just, yeah. I think I just finished my first class and I was like, I can do this. And I get up there and I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my trick to get out of those situations was to get off stage for something. Just not like leave the scene, but like get off stage and yell from off stage. <laughs> so. so you're just like, I'm just gonna get out of the public eye, and something will come to me then. Yeah, just I mean, and I also do that trick uh, when I would improvise with people way above my skill level, like. I remember this one time I did a duo with Tony Beeman, our friend Tony Beeman. Check out his Hunger Down with Seth episode. And uh, I knew he was just going to improv me the hell out of there. So I was like, okay, what I could do is get off stage somewhere and yell at him for some reason. And he'll be on stage doing his thing and he'll figure it out. And it turned out to be uh, Tony saving us. It's like, I mean, that's the thing about working with these phenomenal improvisers um, that you can do, like, everything's a gift, you can do anything, and then you know that they've got your back, and they'll make it make sense, and they'll make it matter, and you're like, how did you do that, and it's just, I, I feel like that's, like, the magic of improv that I really adore, um, but yeah, as I'm saying, and I'm like, yeah, it's, it's the improvisers that can really, that, like, have that skill set, and I'm like, I love that. I love yep. that when I see that happening. Although, have you ever done Bob Prov? What's Bob Prov? So Bob was this guy. I. He would come to duos. I don't know if he was homeless, but let's just say he had a cart. But Jay assured us that he had a place to stay. But he had a cart full of his stuff. And he would come on and he would do improv. And it was just... <laughs> um... <laughs> It, it It's one of those where you don't need to ask for any suggestion. You just go up there and say, what do you want to do? 
and he would just talk about whatever he was thinking at the time. Uh, this one time, <laughs> oh my god, so it was me, Bob, and Adam Dow, and basically Adam just said, what do you want to do, Bob? And he's like, well, I got this uh, doctor's appointment tomorrow, because I have a contagious, it was like a contagious disease, <laughs> so. Oh, whoa, that's lots of information to land on you in a scene in a moment. I immediately hugged him just to cut the tension, just to let everybody <laughs> in the audience know this, you know, if I, you know, he might have a contagious disease, but I'll be the first one to get it. So I hugged him. So we had his, uh, we had his appointment right there on stage, and Bob was just yelling at The trick with Bob was to get him yelling, and I think he unzipped Adam's jacket during the scene and started yelling at him, uh, it's Bob. You know, the the thing about Bob is you just got to experience it for yourself. You know, it, me talking about it can't do it justice. You know, talk to Jay or Tiffany or anybody. Yeah, I, uh, I think I've heard about Bob, but it was usually on, like, Wednesday nights, right? Yep, always on duos. Yeah. I don't, I didn't do a whole lot of duos, um, when I was there. I just, you know, I, I, I had so much going on, I was, I was yeah. just so busy. You're a big gamer, you, you, <laughs> you know, you're like one of those guys who coast through practice and then just hit it out of the park during, uh, the finals. <laughs> Thank you. For a hot second, though, I thought you were switching to Skyrim. Because I, I was, like, when you said gamer, I was like, oh, yeah, 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 I tried it. Anyway. Yeah. I don't want to get into Skyrim because we are running a little bit out of time. But I do want to talk about your, you know, because I try to keep these 35 minutes or less. Um, do you want to talk about My Mindful Adventures? Uh, your website, uh, I, I recently read about how you mix salt and sugar in Russia. And, <laughs> yeah. yeah, oh man, that was, yeah, so um, I have been so busy lately, I haven't created a whole lot of stories um, for my mindful adventure, but uh, one of the things that I want to do tomorrow is write a new um, story, and I haven't decided which of my travel stories I want to write at this point, um, there's a couple that are floating through my mind. There's like a big uh, one that I've written two parts to about how uh, I was in Montreal and I ended up like basically playing dress up in this shop with this like local shop owner. And then we ended up going in like way out in the hills of Montreal. There was this little like dance thing that she knew about. And we ended up like going to this dance um, in this like little building that was like on the side of a church and the whole way up there I'm like uh this might not have been my smartest move like I I might die right now like I don't I don't know this person we just spent an afternoon hanging out um so I'm thinking about writing that story and kind of like how I got there and then you know what actually like happened while I was at the dance and um but that's like a four-part story and I've only written two parts of that yet so Wow, and when you say, so when you say dress up, was it like a thrift shop store? Was it like a boutique? Was it just some weird ethnic store? And when I say weird, it, I mean weird to me. <laughs> it was a boutique, and I almost walked by it. Um, like I was, I, I literally walked past it, and then I was like, no, I really should go in this store. And I honestly, like to this day, can't explain where that thought came from but I turned around and I went back into the store because I was very much in this space of um, needing to trust my gut needing to trust myself and like listen to these things um, and we just started chatting and she was like can I play dress up with you like you don't have to buy anything I just want to like try on some like clothes and so she's like handing me clothes in this dressing room and I'm like trying them on and we're talking about like everything under the sun um so yeah 
was more of that. Weird. What kind of styles were these? Like, yeah. Uh, and <gasps> still, you know, the. Because uh, there's some boutiques up in the U District between 47th and 50th that uh, me and my lady used to. My my sister's huge into thrift, so whenever uh, she would come into town, we would go straight there. But I'm just trying to picture, like, what kind of boutiques? Was it, like, frilly dresses, really vintage stuff, like 50s peacock dresses? Are those, <laughs> is that a thing, peacock? I don't know. I mean, I feel like it should be if it isn't. Like, I feel like that's a dress with a really long trail yeah. that's just... <laughs> Brilliantly colored. Oh, I was thinking like poodle skirt, not peacock skirt. Oh, well, like, yeah, those are actually a thing, I think. But okay. now I want to make this dress. Anyway. Yeah. Um, it was more like bohemian meets dancer sort of style. Gotcha. Yoko Ono 78. Yeah, yeah. Kind of that vein. Um, very, like, there were some pieces that were very me, and then there were other pieces that. Um, were clearly still a part of her brand and her style, but it was very outside of, like, outside of what I would wear and outside of my style. Um, but very flowy, very stretchy. You know, you get into it, you look professional. Um, uh, but at the same time, you can, like, do a pirouette or something. I don't know. Yeah. I can't. But, um, you know, the splits. You could do the splits gotcha. easily. And then she says, wow, the, I'm, I dressed you up. You're my token model for the day. Uh, there's this dance I know of in this area of Montreal that has a mortality rate of more than 30%. Uh, you want to come? Um, well, I, I, I don't remember her mentioning the mortality rate. I think um, that was sort of subtext that I put in there myself. But uh, it, uh, it, I think it came about, um, well, I know how it came about. I guess I'm just like, oh, how much of the story do I want to hold back and tease people with? Of like how, how it got to the point of, of her uh, uh, inviting me up to the dance. I think a good 60 to 65% would be a solid, you know, because I'm looking forward to reading at this on mymindfuladventure.com. And, um, yeah, so... Uh, yeah, just how did the invitation come? She just said, come with me. You're my special person of the night that we're, you know, you're my BFF of the night. Was it like that? Um, it, was, it was like we were talking about um, contact improv and talking about the expression of dance in the world of art. And she was like, oh, yeah, there's this, like, really cool dance thing that's happening. Um, and it's this exclusive group of folks that's an invite only sort of thing and you know blah 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 and we just kept talking about it and talking about it and talking about it and then um eventually she just sort of looked at me she's like are you interested in going and I was like I mean yeah I'm, I'm really curious I'm like I, I, I yeah. think it would be fun to check out she's like oh cool well you want a carpool and I was like oh yeah cool that sounds great and then as I'm like going home I was like what am I doing? Like, how, um, is, uh, so I, like, texted my mom. Like, um, yeah. okay, I'm going up into the hills of Montreal <laughs> with someone I just met. It's fine. We're fine. Everything is fine. Yeah. I'm just gonna go dance. Alright, and was it, like, a more Wiccan or more ballroom? Like, was it Beauty and the Beast ball or was it, uh, in the woods, just flowery type stuff more in the woods flowery type stuff but like meets techno meets okay ballet meets it, it was very um freeform gotcha so the commercial parts of burning man <laughs> yes but none of the none of the drugs just the commercial parts of burning man gotcha I guess that actually is Probably a big part of. I don't. I actually haven't been to Burning Man yet. It's one of my bucket list items. I think it would be cool to to see that. Yeah, I got a buddy who used to do it every summer, and then uh, he'd always invite me, and I was like, "Do I have to do anything?" And he was like, "Yeah." I was like, "No." So, <laughs> you know, I'm 
I'm I'm good enough sweating right here in my apartment by my Xbox. I don't need to go and I, I mean it, you know just no it's the whole sitting out in the desert. Like I'm a huge desert guy. I love I love astronomy. I love stargazing. But it's just desert during the day does not interest me at all. Yeah. Yeah, same here. Yeah. I would have to sleep during the day, I think. Yeah, and uh, I, I'm also not a drugs guy. I don't really do more than uh, anything that's legal, so. Uh, yeah, I... Yeah, I haven't really done anything that's illegal either so and i don't know that i would want to i don't know that being in the middle of the desert that would be the place where i'm like great let's try this illegal thing that's like <laughs> maybe i'll have a bad reaction to it i don't think that's something i want to do in the middle of the desert i don't, yeah. I don't know yeah. but i do want to like like all, i want to see the pyrotechnics i want to see the like the community that people talk about and um I don't know. I, I do like the idea of, like, sort of camping, you know, yeah. in the middle of nowhere. It, it's one of those things. I wish I could have, like, a soft opening for Burning Man. You know, maybe, you know, go there for an hour and a half, just browse, maybe bring a sandwich, and then leave. You know, not the full... Not the full weekend, because with Burning Man, you got to be dedicated for the full weekend. I don't even know how long it is, but you know, you got to have twelve gallons of water minimum. You got to, you know, have four bottles of suntan lotion. You got it, it's just this crazy stuff that I, I'm not a good prepper. I, you know, I'm not, I'm not an adventurer like you. So. I am quite the prepper. That is. I mean, even with all the smoke and the wildfires, like, rolling in um, the last couple of weeks, me and my aunt sat down and we were like, okay, so what's our evacuation route? And what are we packing? And, blah, blah, blah. and like, that's uh, that's very me. Very, okay, so we're going to yeah. just, like, have everything in order, and it's all going to be in this checklist, and then we're just going to check everything down the box, and everything's going to be fine. Yeah, you... Uh, I mean, my preparation is stealing a boat at the marina and going to Mexico. So that's my. <laughs> that's, See, you you have your uh, escape route. This is great. Yeah. Gets... You know, and they're more worried about people going over land, but by sea, you know, you got a good sixty percent chance of getting out there. <laughs> so. Well, uh, it's That is something I want to do is, like, sleep on a boat at some point. I mean, it's not hard. You just go to the marina, you see a boat, you jump on, and, you know. Literally, boat owners usually use their boat once every two weeks. So there's a good chance you'll never get caught if you just go on a random boat and sleep on it. <laughs> okay. I've duly noted, this can only end well, I'm sure. Yeah. But, yeah, like an overnight cruise, I understand that part. Not like a cruise, but like a, you know, private, yeah. Yeah, I would definitely like that, yes, 100%. Hmm. If I can get on a private yacht for a night or two, I'm there. Oh, for sure. So if any of your audience is looking for somebody to, like, be a deckhand, I have no experience, but I'm happy to learn. Yeah, definitely, you know, there's, do you know how to do the sails or know any of the knots? Um, I mean, you could I Google it. I tie a good bow tie, yeah. and I'm a fast learner, and I'm very enthusiastic. Yeah, definitely, you know, and I mean, for anybody who would go into a boutique and end up at a Wiccan disco party, why not? <laughs> That's about accurate. So, to, so let's wrap this up and just uh, talk about your, um, you have a, a petition online involving Lyft and Uber for the upcoming election. Yeah, so, um, like, on that, on that more serious note, we've, I, I am intent on doing everything I can to make sure that this election is fair and representative. And I was very concerned to see a lot of what happened with the USPS 
and more particularly um, a lot of theories coming out about um, fraud and mail-in voting and all of these things. And, uh, you know, I, I definitely hit a point where I was like, all of this is happening and I don't know quite, I want to do something to help make sure that people's voices can be heard, but I don't know what to do or how, like what I can do. Um, and a friend of mine posted on a Facebook page and she basically said like, we should, you know, lift an Uber, uh, we should petition them to offer rides. And I thought, oh yeah. So her and I started talking and did some research and, um, I paused because I actually wrote my latest story was this medium article, uh, that I wrote, which kind of talks about my first experiences with voting and my current experiences with mail-in voting and, uh, points toward this petition. Um, because what we ended up finding out is that Lyft and Uber currently have, um, programs in place to support voting, but these programs are fairly limited. Um, the, only Lyft currently has um, a ride share option, and that is not available in all states. Um, and while both uh, my friend and I, Marissa, recognize that it's not on Lyft and Uber to make sure that all votes get to, the, to be counted, we do think that they are uniquely positioned to be able to help. So our petition asks them to expand these rides, and it also asks them to expand a donation sort of option so that uh, voters who are in a more affluent position, who have the capabilities, um, could support other rides uh, for voters who don't have you know, the time to be able to hop on the bus and get all the way down to the polling place or down to their election center mm -hmm. to be able to submit their ballot. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I'm working on. All right, well, I'll make sure that uh, the petition's link is in the description. Uh, make sure to send me that. And, um, yeah, that, you know, voting, let's get out there, let your voice be heard. I, I know who I'm voting for. I'm not afraid to say that uh, I'm a Harris head, and I'll make sure that she's uh, trying to be a second in line for president. So not a fan of her superior, but, you know, I'll... Anything's better than what, than the apocalypse right now. So you know, I'm looking out my window and it is, I mean, it's 6.50 and all the the street lights outside have been on since 4. So I'm not, oh, man. I'm not blaming the guy in office, but I'm not saying he's helping. I do think that we have to take, you know, I have, um, I have, fairly liberal views and I do think that taking we need to take a much stronger stance when it comes to climate change oh absolutely um, yeah and and I think like you know with this petition really my focus is to is is on fair and representative elections because I'd like to think that the whole of America recognizes the challenges that we're up against um, and of course, like any other person who's voting, I want everybody to vote like me. Um, but more importantly than that, I want our elections to be a clear representation of where we're really at and not, I don't want votes to be lost. I don't want voices to be lost yep. um, because that's how we end up in a worse situation. In oh. my opinion. 100% agree. All right, well, I am going to, for the recording, say uh, this has been Hunkered Down with Seth. That's Sarah Scheller, MyMindfulAdventure.com. Check that out in the description. The petition will be in the description. Um, you could find online risk playing at Hasbro.com. I think they have, it's free, I'm not sure, but check it out. Maybe there's something there. And um, Zigna Poker... That's free as well. And just anything else mentioned, you could probably find it for free online. So, uh, Shara, thank Shara. Sarah, thank you for being on Hunkered Down with Seth. <laughs>